Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all of you who are joining us to see uh, this interview of uh, Dr. George Cassidis, who is uh, currently research fellow at the uh, York St. John University, having formerly been at the University of Birmingham, and who is uh, an authority in the subject of new religions. So a brief word about him and about myself, because we have certain characteristics in common. Both of us were born in what was once the second city of the British Empire. Uh, we followed parallel careers at the University of Glasgow in honours philosophy and in systematic theology. Although um, in other directions we parted company, I became interested in traditional Japanese religion, particularly Shinto, and George, of course, has moved into the field of um, new religions. And this morning he gave us a very illuminating presentation on that subject. And I'd like to welcome you, George, this Thank afternoon you. and ask if uh, you would like to say a little bit. There were two things that, that came across from what people said to me. One was, the, and the first one is simply, um, what makes for the, or what distinguishes the structure of new, religion, new religions from more traditional ones? Well, I think the obvious answer is that they're new, but of course that's not an answer about the, the structure. Um, what do we mean by new? That's another question. And um, I take a liberal view. If it's less than 200 years old, then I think that counts as new, because uh, I'm working on the Jehovah's Witnesses right now, so uh, actually they're not really all that new, but um, mm. they've not been studied as a major tradition and kind of got overlooked when I was a student. Uh, I think they tend to have different structures, um, different new religions, they're not all the same. But as I was saying this morning, um, more often than not, they get it and come from a charismatic leader. And then, uh, as the sociologist Max Weber said, you move from um, charismatic mm -hmm. leadership through to the kind of routinization where uh, the new religion um, has rites and ceremonies and meetings and so on um, to some kind of structure um, which may be um, a community in which mm -hmm. you kind of live with the leader. Um, it may be um, an organisation that is legally incorporated uh, with people with voting rights yeah. and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, the one thing, um, well, I mean, Barker has said the one thing that new religions have in common is that they're all different. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, one can't just generalise as some people do and say this is a typical cult because mm -hmm. they've all committed mass suicide or something like that. Um, they are all different and part of our task is to point to what these differences are and uh, to try and trace the strands of the different uh, new religious traditions. Hmm. Uh, in the course of your discussion this morning, I two thoughts crossed my mind. Mm. Um, and this relates to the second question, really, is uh, namely um, groups that are, in a sense, different in the U.S., particularly like the um, the uh, the Amish uh, yes. in, in yes. Pennsylvania. I have wondered whether these are can be looked upon simply as a group of people who are, as it were, have given up on time and history, mm. or whether there is some sense of cultic as well in them. Difficult one. Um, I've uh, visited an Amish community once, but I've never um, engaged mm. with them to any great extent. Um, I think, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're trying to get back to an ancient form of Christianity, mm. but they're doing it in a different way, because yeah. what they're doing is to say, well, um, we're rejecting all the features of modern technology, we're going back mm -hmm. to simple living. Mm -hmm. um, the Jehovah's Witnesses take a slightly different view about that. They're prepared to move with the times in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. In fact, they've got quite the latest technology if you look at what's on their website. Mm -hmm. um, but they take the view that um, time does move on, but um, so long as it's uh, not uh, prohibited in the Bible, which mm -hmm. is their touchstone, then um, it's permissible to move with the times. 
But um, uh, the Amish are, uh, well, they're Celtic in the sense that um, they're uh, a community with a particular ethos and um, have got their own way of life. And um, they tend to be um, a close community in terms of their living. Mm -hmm. Although when I was out there um, back in 1999, um, it was obvious they were moving with the times a bit too because um, they were seeing that it wasn't so easy just to live um, uh, on their own territory, on their own terms, and um, they actually needed to create a bit of wealth to keep mm. themselves going. And um, a lot of them went into selling ice creams. That seemed to be yeah, what uh, interested like, them. In. Like yeah. fries making chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> ah. But yeah, they were kind of interacting with the tourists that were coming to that degree. Mm. So uh, I mean, sometimes you can't close yourself off mm -hmm. forever. From the sublime to the somewhat more strange and bizarre, crossed my mind also that within the field of the cultic that of course was the famous incident in Guyana when uh, mm. the people's temple were instructed by their leader to commit mass suicide yeah and uh, I, I'm well aware that there may be other factors involved but I'd, I'd be interested to hear you read on that situation in relation to what you're seeing about you know people being part of a cult yeah well, when people say it was part of a cult, um, I think a number of things have to be borne in mind. One is that uh, Jim Jones was ordained as a mainstream uh, minister in the Disciples of Christ. So what was distinctive about him was that he actually took this group to Guyana mm -hmm. and they started that community from scratch in the middle of the jungle which I think was an amazing achievement. Uh, I'm not saying what Jim Jones did was okay, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think uh, you know, credit where it's due. People don't follow a leader uh, if he's just offering mm -hmm. mass suicide. I uh, mean, that would be daft. And people that follow religions um, like uh, the People's Temple, by and large, aren't daft. Um, mm -hmm. the, I think the thing about Jim Jones was that um, he offered um, a very high aspirational ideal, which is, I think, something I omitted, I omitted to say this morning. Mm -hmm. um, very often that is what a new religious leader will do. Um, he won't just say, well, uh, we'll, we'll have an organisation that sings a few hymns on a Sunday mm -hmm. and has a jumble sale now and again. Mm -hmm. um, they actually go beyond in terms mm -hmm. of the amount of commitment yeah. they want. Yeah. So what Jim Jones wanted was um, a community that was um, free of racial discrimination and prejudice, um, drawing on uh, people from um, various ethnic groups mm -hmm. to have them live together. And um, essentially because of the opposition he was experiencing, um, largely by a number of people that were racist, to be honest. Um, yeah. He moved them out. He thought, well, if I can't establish that community in the United States, um, we're going to move mm -hmm. elsewhere. There were other factors involved. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Jones was obsessed with the idea of there being a nuclear holocaust. And mm -hmm. um, he researched a number of places that were safe havens, as he called them. And Guyana was one of these, so it served a double purpose. Um, it was going to escape the great conflagration that he thought was coming, but it also was a place where he could establish his community, hopefully um, free from prejudice and opposition. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. The anti-cult people um, went on campaigning and um, the uh, senator, Senator Ryan, came out yes, to see yeah, what was yeah, happening yeah. and that really uh, put a match to everything and um, there, w there was the big shootout at the airport. Well, it wasn't that big. There were four of them went out to, mm -hmm. uh, to shoot the senator and um, then Jones obviously knew that more people were going to move in and yeah. um, that was the cue for the suicide. Incidentally, it was very definitely something that uh, people would know what they were doing because um, well, somebody said to me after my talk, um, didn't they have practices uh, in committing mm. uh, suicide? And sure, they, they did. Um, Jim Jones had what he called the White Knights, mm -hmm. uh, Knights spelled N-I-G-H-T, mm -hmm. um, where they uh, went out and they uh, actually practiced drinking the, uh, the mix of Kool-Aid and obviously it wasn't really cyanide when it was a mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. But when you think that um, 900 and 
11 people, I think it was, yes. um, yeah. died on the site. There were a few more at the airport. Then you can't really have that number of people dying of cyanide poisoning not knowing what was happening. No, quite. It yeah. would be a very long queue that would form. Yeah. And uh, cyanide acts pretty fast, I believe. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they would actually see people dying off before they actually got to the buckets of poison. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, fact, the second major question that was raised in my mind and raised by other people was uh, what uh, prompts people nowadays with all the other alternatives and attractions in the modern world, why cults still have that kind of fascination even when they are among the list that you gave? Some of them are, to say the least, bizarre. Yeah. Um, well, some of them are bizarre. I think when people ask me what attracts people to new religious movements, uh, my first answer is to say, well, actually, most people aren't attracted. Mm -hmm. Right, if you think of the passage of uh, Heaven's Gate, mm -hmm. it started off with public lectures in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, they, weren't, they weren't mobbed out. Uh, I don't have statistics about how many people actually came, mm -hmm. but I think we, we're probably talking about maybe 100 people at the most mm -hmm. and eventually um, Applewhite and Nettles gathered together I think it was 200 people at their height mm -hmm. right so uh, when you think of the population of the United States then it's not all that high no. it's more followers than I attract to be honest but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's certainly a very low proportion of the population mm -hmm. and then uh, for various reasons people dropped out and uh, he was left with roughly 40 people um, the, there was one guy that walked out when he started mentioning suicide, so um, it's not that everyone is brainwashed, it is actually possible to recognise what's going on and to say, well, it's not for me. Um, there was another person who um, got out to uh, alert people to what was happening, mm -hmm. and um, again, Applewhite knew this was going on mm -hmm. and uh, clearly wanted that to happen. Um, there were another couple that, uh, interestingly, we met at the American Academy of Religion last year. Um, they had decided to leave the group. So Applewhite um, and his followers knew what was happening. Um, it was possible for people to drop out, and they did. Interestingly, we met a couple at the American Academy of Religion who had been followers um, of Applewhite, but had decided that uh, the time wasn't right for them. They said they weren't ready. Mm -hmm. And um, they believed that at some point in the future they would reincarnate and uh, be ready for the next um, opening that was going to take place in the future. So um, you get all sorts of different reactions to it. Um, and um, yeah, people opt in to new religions, I think, for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's the leader. Perhaps not so often it's the leader because when the movement grows, you don't get meeting the leader until uh, a further stage of uh, your mm -hmm. initiation. And then sometimes it may be the community. Um, as I said at the end of my talk, I think there may be reasons that keep people in, like the idea of, um, well, the idea of changing the world is one that people often cite, but there is also the idea that your earthly cares are taken away from you, mm -hmm. you're looked after, your meals are made for you, unless you're one of the people that makes the meals, um, you don't necessarily have the financial planning, um, you find your particular role within the uh, organisation and it's routinized, it's institutionalised, mm -hmm. so you're kind of like the cog in the wheel that, mm -hmm. um, that fits in and you don't need to think about job applications, mm -hmm. um, organising your personal finances unless you decide to leave. So it really, in a sense, trades on people's desire sometimes not to be too independent and to become dependent on a bigger system that will take care of them. Well, I think we're all dependent on something to some degree. I think the question is how we choose to exercise that kind of dependence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been dependent on universities and on students all my life, um, <laughs> but in a different sort of way. So uh, 
I guess it's up to them. In the mainstream Christian tradition, and indeed in other religions, we've had a tradition of uh, people belonging to institutions where uh, they were looked after and mm -hmm. supported oh, yes. by the laity. So uh, there's nothing necessarily new in that regard. And I think one thing we do need to ask ourselves when we start to criticise new religions is whether uh, traditional religions have been doing the same sort of thing, because mm -hmm. very often they have. Yeah. George, George began this morning by asking us, uh, or by telling us that he was the Messiah and asking if we'd all like to jump off Brighton Pier and commit suicide. And he got, uh, I think, two said yes, and I said I'd come and watch. There were actually three that said yes. Three said yes. I think they were joking. Actually, I didn't specify jumping off Brighton Pier. I haven't quite worked out how we would do this, but never mind. <laughs> but incidentally, just to vote the cameras, I'm not the Messiah. I was only pretending, honest. <laughs> um, it uh, certainly woke people up if they had been resting this morning uh, in, in any kind of um, academic, uh, if you like, um, sleep, slumber. We're certainly awakened from it by, by your comments. And we're very grateful to you for coming here and doing this and uh, for raising a topic. In fact, I don't think it's been discussed at an IFA conference since the beginning. So. Many thanks, George, and we look forward to having you back again one day. Well, thanks for having me, and I've really enjoyed my visit. Thank you.